Hello, London. Um, thanks so much for having me at COGX. Um, if we're going to get the next 10 years right in health and medicine, it's going to have to be much more intelligent, much more data-driven, digitalized, precise, and hopefully democratized to enable health and medicine across the planet and move us from an era of intermittent reactive sick care to a future of continuous proactive health and biomedicine. Now, I got up this morning inspired to do a little bit of art. I'm a terrible artist, so I went to Stability AI to have some pictures of the future of medicine. And it's an example of upskilling me. I'm not a good artist, but now using new generative AI technologies that we've been talking about here this last few days, we have the opportunity to upskill all of us to be a great artist or maybe even a great clinician. And it's really been a bit of a Gutenberg moment. We heard from Tristan Harris yesterday about how AI and machine learning is accelerating faster than society, and certainly healthcare uh, is ready to adapt it. And it's really starting to move into the clinical realm. I mean, where I trained in Boston at Mass General, Boston Children's Hospital, they're starting to use prompt engineers and integrate it into care. We're seeing desperate parents use ChatGPT to diagnose their children when many specialists failed to do so. But, you know, we're still in the early days. There's lots of challenges with bias, mistakes, sometimes mis disinformation. It's still early days. And so I think the, the, what's coming next in the initial phases of using AI in healthcare is to lower the friction level, the ability to connect with your clinical care team, integrate your genomics, and soon to enter an era of what I call generative health, where you'll have your own personal health bot that understands you, your culture, your language, uh, and how to communicate with you across the healthcare paradigm. So imagine any sort of world that you can build to keep you healthy rather than just waiting for disease to occur. So of course, health is wealth, right? We've been talking these last couple of days about the accelerating technologies that are all around us, and it's our opportunity to put those technologies together to imagine the future of healthcare. Back in 2011, I gave my second TED Talk, The Future of Medicine, there's an app for that. Back in 2011, there was only about 15, 20,000 health apps. Now there's over 300,000. And the theme of that talk, and even I think a lot of what we're talking about here over these days, is the super convergence of technologies that enables us to do things better, smarter, faster, cheaper, and as we've seen, what used to fit on a desktop computer in 2000 now fits on our smartwatch, which is, which is our FDA cleared to diagnose disease and give us information about our longitudinal health. And we have a whole new set of tools that didn't exist 20-something years ago when I was a Stanford medical student, from computational biology to chat GPT to robotic surgery, that give us these new tools to reimagine the future of health and medicine across the planet. And not just for the traditional sort of sick care side of the equation, increasingly to think about living a long time, not just longevity and wellness, but the idea of health span. You know, no one wants to be 120 and feel 120. So we're starting to enter this new era of what's often called rejuvenative or restorative medicine. And so if you can stay healthy and on this trajectory, uh, some of these new emergent technologies will come together to really move the needle to help us live longer and healthier lives. Now, we know technology, of course, is important, but the biggest determinant to our health is often not our genetic code, but our zip code. You know, we know that the social determinants of health play a key role in our health span and longevity. So paying attention to water, vaccines, social connection, and increasingly the digital determinants of health. You have access to Wi-Fi and digital information. So if we want to enter this new health span era, do the basic things today. Optimize your exercise, your sleep, your personalized nutrition, your social connection, as we heard about, and even your sense of purpose. If you want to live to 100, why do you want to live to 100 or beyond? So we're in 2023. It used to be the future. When I go back to Mass General Hospital, where I trained uh, in internal medicine and pediatrics, you know, we're still using fax machines to communicate, paper forms. I had my own cardiac study done at Stanford a few months ago. I got my results on a CD-ROM. I don't even own a CD-ROM player anymore. So we're still often wiring our healthcare in the technologies of the past. We like to think that we're practicing, you know, precision medicine, but it's still often imprecise medicine. The top-selling drugs today are only effective for one in four to one in 24 of the patients who take them. And while we've seen many fields get disrupted from digital banking to digital entertainment, we've seen all of our lives been horribly disrupted over the last three years from the COVID pandemic. And on the positive side, we've seen that COVID made us realize that while many fields had reached the fourth industrial age, healthcare and medicine is often stuck in the third or sometimes the second industrial age, and it acted as a bit of a catalyst. It helped move us forward in many new ways. So just like you know, Sputnik sparked the space age, COVID sparked a bit of a new health age and has moved things forward faster. So I gave a TED talk 10 years after the last one about how COVID had catalyzed the future of health and medicine, and it, I want to give us that perspective of where were we 10 years ago, where are we now, and where might we be in the next 10 years? How do we get that right across health and medicine? Because the last 10 years were pretty exciting, but the next 10 years will make the last 10 years look slow. And I love this quote from Bill Gates, that most people tend to overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. So buckle your seatbelts. 
So I've been enrolled looking at the future of healthcare for, for 10 plus years. I, I chair a program for a decade called Exponential Medicine, now called NextMed Health, where we bring together technologists, patients, investors, innovators from across technology and healthcare to reimagine healthcare. We've even had the chair of NHS Innovation, Tony Young, there several times, who shared this old quote that sometimes it's not the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. So what old, idea, old ideas might be holding you or your colleagues or your, or your clinicians back? And in fact, Tony and his NHS Clinical Entrepreneurship Program has been building the future of healthcare here in England by catalyzing entrepreneurs across the NHS system. So that's a great example of building the future, future from those who need and see the problems. So what is the future of medicine? Uh, it was the cover of Nat Geo. I was lucky to write the opening article a couple years ago. And it's not really about 12 innovations or any innovation. It's how we connect those innovations to accelerate knowledge and move things forward. Let's look 10 years back and where we're going forward in the next decade, starting with genomics. We heard a bit about genomics earlier. 10 years ago, the price of a sequencing whole genome was about 10,000 pounds. Now it's dropped to maybe 100 or 200 pounds. We can start to use our basic genomics, our pharmacogenetics, to pick the right drugs, whether it's for longevity or the right statin or antihypertensive med. We can look at common diseases like type 2 diabetes, not as one disease, but their genetic level and crowdsourced genomic information for many, as we heard earlier about Genomics England, connecting the dots and feeding back genomic information to the clinic and vice versa. And increasingly, we're starting to sequence our children, you know, even before they're born, and we're going to start to do risk stratification and individualized care from the pediatric realm to geriatrics. And when we identify a problem early, we're now earning the genomics age, uh, uh, the ability to, you know, not to sequence, and, but to write DNA, whether it's mRNA or gene editing, to cure diseases like sickle cell or thalassemia, or maybe even prevent diseases before they occur. So it's a pretty exciting time in genomics, but it's not the, the genome that's moving quickly. We have the proteome, the exposome, the sociome, your metabolomics, your um, microbiome, the bugs on our gut, in our, on our skin, play a huge role in our future of health. And if we integrate those, those databases, that's where we can start to really gain actionable information. It's not about any one omics. It's the idea of putting them together, which is often the buzzword of the day, the digital twin, including for healthcare. It might simulate your cardiac health or your cardiac uh, or your therapy for a specific cancer. So many of these technologies in genomics and beyond are, are moving exponentially, right? Moore's law is accelerating, which is why, you know, the, even my old iPhone 2 from 15 years ago is, you know, more powerful than a crazy supercomputer. So Moore's law is powerful. It's starting to be applied to healthcare. You know, many of the technologies we grew up with are now appified. They've been dissolved. They've been digitized. As we heard earlier from Jack, we're entering the age of quantum computing, which is going to really change things in digital biomarkers from drug discovery. So back to sort of my favorite exponential technology, the smartphone. You know, it's moving very, very quickly. Soon, it may even dissolve into our, you know, uh, our digital uh, Apple glasses, which are hopefully going to come to market very soon. Um, they're getting smaller and smaller. To the next decade, we'll see them dissolve into our contact lenses, which we'll use as ways to interface with health information. We're going to see incre increasingly the world of augmented virtual and extended reality, the chatbot that appears that's personalized to us. So in this new world of extended reality, we have the ability to glean and make sense of this information in real time. You know, it could be in the operating room to make sense of complex surgical information. It could be guiding a surgeon step by step through a surgery and crowdsourcing knowledge from other surgeons. And this starts off kludgy and expensive. You know, the, the headsets of today and even my, you know, old antique 10 year old Google Glass, you know, they're not consumer products yet, but increasingly they're going to blend into our contact lenses and beyond. And we can take, you know, lessons from other fields. I've been a pilot, I've been a flight surgeon and fighter squadrons at F-16s and F-15s. We use heads-up displays in the cockpit to keep our heads out of the round dials. Where's the bad guy? Who's shooting at you? Are you about to run into a mountain? And it talks to us and gives us an insight. If we're about to hit a mountain, it reminds us. Cool. Ah. That'll wake you up, right? What if we have augmented and virtual reality in our health? We see our breakfast in one way, and through our augmented contacts, we see it in a different way, and it gives us a little nudge before we have that unhealthy breakfast. Cool. Ah. So, taking lessons from aviation, you know, I started flying 20-something years ago with the round dials, sort of the analog world. Uh, my new plane is still a two-seater, but it has a glass cockpit and GPS and real-time information and weather. That sort of insight is going to start becoming our situational awareness across health and biomedicine. Of course, there's also now the world of virtual reality. It's really fun to put grandma on a roller coaster, of course, but virtual reality is not just for video gaming. It's becoming a therapy, a tool to treat uh, depression or pain or manage our physical therapy. 
VR is also becoming a real key platform for the future and today of, of medical education. Instead of see one, do one, teach one as a, a clinician, you see one and simulate it, simulate it until you get it right in virtualized environments. And increasingly, our clinicians are going to be guided in these environments to up-level and learn from thousands and millions of cases to do the right thing so the average clinician is now up-level to the 98th percentile. So just like we have driver assist, it's now coming to clinician assist across healthcare, upskilling a community health worker or each of you or your advanced surgeon uh, down the street. So what about the world of, of diagnostics? We want to pick up disease early rather than late. A decade, we saw the very first sort of smartphones connected with a basic glucometer. We saw the very first examples of an EKG that could be on a phone that was a prototype, but 10 years later, you can go on Amazon and buy a, a 12 lead EKG that fits on a, on a credit card. Other vital signs are coming to our wristwatches. Uh, we're soon, soon seeing the advent of, of blood pressure devices and even blood sugar that will be in your next generation wearable devices. Continuous information that's going to give us whole new insights to our continuous healthcare data. Or we don't need to wear anything today. The camera on your laptop or smartphone can basically connect and look at you or face and calculate your blood pressure, your heart rate, your oxygen saturation. So these new tools of the medical selfie are already here. So our smartphone camera can do smart things. If you might have a urinary tract infection or a pregnant or uh, have early uh, kidney disease, you can, instead of bringing the urine to the lab, you can dip it on a dipstick, take a picture with your smartphone, and have that information, boom, presented dramatically right to your pharmacist or to your physician, uh, easy peasy. So lab to phone. So these new digital tools, of course, are bringing becoming ubiquitous. If you're a parent, you can use your smartphone to diagnose your kid's ear infection uh, before they uh, need to see the pediatrician. You can use the microphone on your smartphone to listen to your voice as a biomarker, this idea of acoustic epidemiology. It can pick up early signs of mental health, of neurologic disease, or cophalytics, the sound of your cough. Is it a common a cold? Is it croup? Or is it COVID? That can all be detected by the sound of your cough using AI machine learning. Now, the more powerful thing we can do with our internet of medical things and wearables is to change our behaviors, because most of our downstream morbidity, mortality isn't from our genetics, it's from our bad behaviors. Too much smoking, uh, jet lag like I have, uh, too much drinking, not enough sleep. And we're only early in this you know, behavior tracking era. The first Fitbit only launched in 2009. Now, most of you probably have some sort of wearable. I'm wearing like 15 different wearables at the moment. And the potential for these wearables and otherables is that it can start to measure almost every element of physiology and behavior. And we can use those not just for health, but to manage disease. The sensors are going from our wrist into pills to track adherence. They're going into patchable devices uh, that can be an ultrasound that you can wear continuously. There are sensors in your socks, sockables, underwearables that you just put your underwear on and you're censored for the day. Earable type devices that can track physiology from your ear, sweatable devices, whether you're running a marathon or have heart disease, even UK-based companies that do breathable type de devices that are basically in nanonodes that can pick up signs of metabolic disease or cancers from the molecules in your breath. And of course, our consumer wearables, the ring as a data source, it can really track your sleep. And if you guys do nothing else from this talk, take some sort of health technology and optimize your sleep, but it can optimize and track your sleep and scorify it. It can also predict if you're pregnant five days before a home pregnancy test or predict that you have COVID. And these sorts of wearables and other wearables are getting more and more powerful. They're now small patches that are disposable, maybe five pounds a day, that can track basically an intensive care unit level of data and can stream that to your clinician, to your physician, to your pharmacist, to your nutritionist, and they can, we can now use that information to optimize prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. And it doesn't need to be a fancy device. It could be a simple wearable, some of which are being provided by the NHS. When you send a patient home after a total hip replacement, are their steps increasing every day as you'd expect? Are they getting slower? Is something going on where we need to intervene early before they have a fall? And if folks do have problems with mobility, increasingly wearables can help uh, someone who's paralyzed walk. The next generation of exoskeletons are here. I got to try one out uh, in uh, uh, Europe uh, last year. And these sort of exoskeletons will now help those who are normally abled or 100 years old to walk normally. My favorite wearable being a pilot is that of the jet soap developed here uh, by Gravity in the UK. That's being even tried uh, to rescue folks in mountain regions. Uh, I got to try flying it most of the time. I did not look like James Bond. But you know, these are the ultimate wearable. What else can we start to measure that's critical to health? It's food. Food is medicine, say, but said by Hippocrates. We can start to measure our food, whether it has the number of calories, that it, whether it has gluten in it. So we can measure our inputs, and we can start to measure our outputs in very seamless ways. So the idea of, yes, uh, censored toilets are already here. 
or we can start to measure our metabolomics and integrate that information. So instead of taking that one-size-fits-all fad diet, we're going to integrate metabolome, genome, metabolomics, and other information to truly personalize your diet for prevention, wellness, or therapy. So 10 years from now or sooner, our digital exhaust, our digitome, will be collected 24-7. Who owns that data? How do we make sense of it? How do we integrate that into prevention, diagnostics, and therapy? Because these diagnostic tools, including imaging, are getting much more powerful and increasingly are being empowered by AI. I had my full body MRI done for about 2,000 pounds recently. Now it's powered by AI radiology. Soon, while they're expensive today, in a, in a decade, those sorts of technologies might come to your corner Walgreens or Boots and have an AI radiologist read them. So ubiquitous scanning. Some of these scanners are getting small and portable. I had my own brain MRI going down a Hudson River on a boat in five minutes plugged into wall power. So we can start to democratize diagnostics. Or not need an MRI machine at all with a wearable device like this one called Open Water that can diagnose tumors and strokes and even give therapy to the brain. So I, as a clinician, have my own sort of digital doctor's bag. This sort of digital diagnostic toolkit can go to a nurse in rural Africa or be in your own pocket. You now might uh, purchase your own sort of stethoscope. You don't need to be a cardiologist today to listen to heart sounds with an you know, AI-powered echo uh, stethoscope that listens to heart sounds and does an EKG. Or in fact, the ultrasound is going away. The, the stethoscope is turning into the pocket ultrasound. Less than 2,000 pounds will be in almost every clinician's pocket. And again, it can democratize diagnostics almost anywhere on the planet, giving early detection, early warning, and early therapy. Now, some of this needs smart collaboration. During the pandemic, I chaired the XPRIZE Pandemic and Health Alliance. We ran XPRIZES to form new forms of diagnostic platforms. You might remember in 2020, 2021, there were no frequent, fast, cheap, or easy COVID tests. We had 700 teams from 70 plus countries design new versions of COVID tests, many of which are now in the market, which are going to help democratize diagnostics, not just for COVID and other infectious diseases, but for non-infectious conditions that you'll do at home. Now, the challenge is, whether it's a wearable or a lab test, how do we integrate this? We've talked a lot about AI here at COGX. I like to not call it AI, but IA, intelligence augmentation. And it's 10 years ago, IBM Watson was a bit hyped. So I want to remind you not just of Moore's law, but of Amara's law. Sometimes we tend to overestimate what may be happening in two years and underestimate what will be here in 10 years. So as we look to get the next 10 years right, let's not underestimate what will be here. We already have powerful AI meets radiology platforms. We have AI meets uh, colonoscopy to help your gastroenterologist find a lesion that might have been missed. We can democratize eye care and diagnostics in many parts of the world using a simple camera looking at the, at the retina. We can reduce medical errors in using ChatGPT as a co-pilot in the intensive care unit or the rural clinic. We can also leverage AI machine learning, of course, into drug discovery. Traditionally, it still takes 10 years, billions of dollars, lots of drugs fail. We're starting to see AI really help us develop the next generation of mRNA vaccines, not just for COVID, but for cancer and Alzheimer's. And we've seen now companies design drugs, bring them into animal studies, into humans in 18 months, uh, speeding up trial results and lowering costs and improving outcomes. So it's not going to be, you know, human versus machine. It's going to be more of a cobot. We need to learn how to collaborate in this new augmented intelligence age. Sometimes we'll be appearing on the scene through telehealth in robotic systems, which are increasingly leveraging AGI. We'll be providing levels of care, particularly where there's a short shortage of doctors or nurses. So we need to partner, right? AI is not going to replace your doctor or nurse or pharmacist, but those using AI will replace those who don't. A lot of this comes together in this new age that's often called mobile health or connected health or digital health. The ability to take all these new forms of data and make them personal to you or be useful for your clinic or your public health system. And it's not just digital health as a data source, but also prescribing digital tools, digital therapeutics or digiceuticals. It might be an app to treat smoking cessation or digital platforms for mental health or video games for kids that are now FDA approved that treat ADHD better than Ritalin. And these tools enable us to treat, but also connect information. We talked about wearables and quantified self. Increasingly, our digital exhaust is going to flow to our clinicians or our health systems, and it'll make them learning systems, right? We'll use that data, crowdsource it, and use it to measure and optimize health span and longevity, to diagnose disease at stage zero, and then therapy that can be much more personalized and data-driven. And we can already start to integrate that on our smartphones, Apple, Android. Platforms like Verily, the spin out from Apple, from Google, is doing the All of Us trial, uh, the, uh, the baseline trial. Thousands of volunteers sharing their digital exhaust, their genomics. Like we heard of All of Us Health here in the UK, in the US, we have the All of Us trial. A million Americans sharing their genomics, their wearable data, and that data is starting to come back to data donors like myself to make it useful. 
So it's an exciting time to make sense of the data and make it actionable insights. Imagine each of us has a bit of a FICO score, a financial score for our health, based on our labs, our behaviors, our financial health, our sexual health, our social health, right? Or imagine that we can integrate all these forms of information and give ourselves a personal check engine light before we blow a gasket. We're already here in this, you know, era of the, of the check engine light for the body. One of my colleagues at Stanford, Mike Snyder, super connected guy, all his data gave him early warning that he had Lyme disease or that he had early diabetes. They also showed that an Apple Watch can diagnose uh, COVID two days before a PCR test becomes positive. So in the next decade, let's say 2033, you'll almost be the era of minority report. You're going to get a ping on your watch to let you know you have a, a challenge before you get diagnosed or need to go to the emergency. So today, there are already a lot of these new digital health solutions. It's hard to keep up with them. And I've been trying to make sense of all this, so I've launched a platform called digital.health. That's the website. If you go to digital.health, you can look up over 3,000 digital health solutions, a bit of a digital health formulary. So you might be looking at new forms of diagnostics. So for example, uh, there are uh, devices that can do the EKG. You can learn about their evidence base. You can put it in your own formula. You can prescribe it to yourself or to a patient. You might be looking at what's happening uh, in the world of diabetes and looking for solutions that relate to treating diabetes with nutrition and find platforms like Verda Health. So that's an example of finding what's here today. So check out digital.health and see what might be useful for you or your community's health. Ultimately, though, we need to integrate all this information to make it useful. No clinician or patient can make sense of all this new omics and keep it in their head. We're clearly in the era of trillions of connected devices. The internet of medical things is here. 5G today, 6G tomorrow. And no doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or patient wants more data. They want the actual insights. They want to be able to connect the dots between all these data silos and make them useful as we glean more knowledge. That knowledge needs to go and connect to the individual and the clinician. So we don't want to just create more data. We need to narrow that gap from data to information and that information going to the bedside and website, not in 17 years, but in 17 days or 10 days. And COVID did accelerate what used to take 10 years, sometimes into 10 days uh, or, or, or less. So let's take that energy of connecting the dots between digital information and speeding up healthcare. And not just speeding it up, but making it better for the clinician, who's often burnt out by technology, having to enter information into medical record systems. You've heard of the burnout situation even before COVID. So we need to design solutions with clinicians in mind. And as we've heard recently, uh, with OpenAI and Microsoft, they're creating the ability to listen to the, the, the patient, clinician, doctor relationship and write those notes for you. So I think a big part of this future of healthcare is not just big data, but again, crowdsourcing it. Imagine 15 years ago, we used to drive with paper maps. Now you couldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or Waze. I think in a decade from now or sooner, we're going to start crowdsourcing health finding others on our healthcare journeys, not just the journey that we're on, leveraging that together. So we're not just blood donors or organ donors, we can become data donors and learn collectively. And that can engage each of us, the idea of patient included. If you're designing a new app or a hospital or health system, get patients included. They're the need knowers. They know how to integrate care into their own lives. And we can now also enable each of us to crowdsource into clinical trials. The era of digital clinical trials this year, uh, when I was diagnosed with COVID right before vaccines came out, I was searching around and the cookies were very good and the, I got a, uh, a ping on Facebook. Have you been diagnosed with COVID? And I said, well, yes, I have. I got a phone call 10 minutes later from a researcher at University of Washington. The next day, a drug arrived with an app and a connected blood pressure cuff and I was part of a clinical trial. That is gonna accelerate new knowledge. And I used to talk about this idea of virtual trials and this ways of healthcare and I then rent met one of the founders of Waze, actually has built a Waze-like platform you can all try today called StuffThatWorks.Health, where millions of patients are sharing what's working for long COVID, for migraines, for cancer, for depression. And I think it's that kind of example that will start to integrate into information about patients like me or patients like us as we move forward. So it's an exciting age to start crowdsourcing health information and leveraging that around the planet. So I encourage us to help our health systems have a share button as we move into this new era. Finally, how do we shift how care is delivered, right? We all experienced our first telemedicine, uh, maybe during the COVID pandemic. We're increasingly having hybridized care. Big picture, we're going to move from our era of sick care based on intermittent episodic data, usually only collected in the four walls of the clinic or emergency or ICU. That intermittent data uses our usual model. We wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack or a stroke or in my world of oncology, a late stage cancer. The big picture of future is to leverage all this new continuous data make it much more personalized, much more proactive, uh, and make it much more available so that we can bring care anytime, anywhere for everyone 
and giving better outcomes and even lower costs for healthcare, whether it's in the UK or around the world. And part of that means care has to shift increasingly from hospital to home to phone to even inside our bodies, right? We're seeing that the movement from what's often called hospital to home or hospital to homespital. These new emerging technologies can replace a hospital bed for many uh, of our current cases. And much of how we interact with healthcare professionals will shift. Many of you have done a chat visit or a FaceTime or a, a Zoom with a doctor. The future isn't going to be just talking to the doctor or clinician on the, on the app. We're increasingly leverage chatbots. Some are built in the, in the UK, like Ada Health. They're increasingly going to know your genome, what you did last summer, what your wearable devices told you, and give you smart insights and triage to clinical care when you need it in much smart, smart, impactful ways. And your doctor may even show up as a personalized avatar that looks exactly like them or like Einstein or like your mother. It's increasingly entering this world of not just the metaverse, but the med everse where our clinical uh, integrations will feel much more real and not just on the flat screen. And anyone can be turned into an avatar today with uh, several cameras and a little bit of AI. You can all uh, show up as an avatar, increasingly animated by ChatGPT and beyond. Which sort of begs the question, as we move to more virtualized and hybrid care, who do we choose to be a medical student, a physician, a nurse, a pharmacist? We don't need to have just good bedside manner. We need new website manner. We need to think carefully about how do we train the clinicians of the future to leverage these new uh, exciting and fast moving tools. Finally, as we move to this era of data-driven and precision health, we can take the idea of almost ultra-personalization, 3D printing, good 3D print braces, or a medical implant, or a hearing aid. What if we could take AI machine learning and your digital twin and predict the right cocktail of drugs or medications for prevention and longevity, or to treat your diabetes and hypertension instead of taking a pile of pills, which many folks have difficulty taking in, in wrong doses, that idea of polypharmacy, instead of taking a pile of pills, what if you could 3D print your own personalized polypill? I call them IntelliMeds, this idea of a pill built for you that adapts to you, it's based on your genomics, and could even be printed every morning at your bedside, changing your dose of blood thinner or uh, blood pressure medicine. So that's a, a technology we're developing, and hopefully in 10 years or less, you'll be able to 3D print your medication, and it will adapt to you based on your data and learnings from other patients around the planet. So big picture, we're hopefully entering this exciting new health age, not just a sick care age. It's a real opportunity for all of us particularly the innovators and investors and technologists here at COGX to not just think about the silos of AI, machine learning and wearables and virtual reality and 3D printing and nanotech and, and blockchain and CRISPR, but to think about they can, how they converge, how they super converge and how we can leverage that super convergence to address the pain points of today and the near future. So if we want to get the next 10 years right, we don't want to be thinking about what's just happening today in 2023. We want to be skating to where the puck is going to be, like Wayne Gretzky says. Think about chat GPT 7 and 8 and 9. And if we can leverage that sort of exponential convergent mindset, we can go from today's era of intermittent reactive sick care, kind of one size fits all that's, you know, provider dependent using human brain and cognition to future that's uh, precise, personalized, proactive, preventative, hybridized, leveraging personalized information and crowdsourced information aligned with the workflow and incentives of patients, community, healthcare systems. And that takes a village, not just clinicians, inventors, technologists, but government and policy thinkers as well. So let's not take incremental steps, let's take exponential steps. Let's build this health age together. As we've seen over the last couple of days, the future of everything is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. It's up to all of us, not just to those in healthcare or technology, not to predict that future of health and medicine, but build it boldly for all of us here on Spaceship Earth. So with that, let's build a healthcare future for all of us. Thanks very much.